Black Dahlia Episode 11 Leslie Dillon Part 1 Not much is known about the early years of our next suspect, Leslie Dwayne Dillon aka Jack Sands. He was born on the 4th of July 1921 in Ralston, Oklahoma to parents Ray and Mamie. He spent his boyhood years in Cushing, Oklahoma. His father worked as a metal worker and his mother moved in with her mother and worked as a cook. Dylan served in the Navy during World War II, but was dishonorably discharged after only a year for stealing wristwatches. After the war, he made his way to San Francisco, where, according to Pew Eatwell in her book Black Dahlia, Red Rose, was arrested in 1946, accused with being a pimp. He was soon married to wife Georgia, and they had a daughter. The family drifted around the country, spending time in San Francisco, and Los Angeles, California, Miami, Florida, and Oklahoma City. He was a character of questionable nature. He changed his hair color as often as he changed jobs. Again according to Pew Eat Well, Dylan worked as a bellhop, rum runner, bootlegger, beer bottler, pimp, gambler, taxi driver, dance instructor. And probably most questionable, he used multiple aliases, including Jack Dylan Maxim, Jack Diamond, and most notably Jack Sand, the alias he will use when contacting Dr. Deriver, and thus beginning what would become one of the most controversial aspects of the Dahlia investigation, the Dillon Affair. It has been confirmed that he worked for three weeks as a mortuary assistant at Han's funeral home in Oklahoma City, and told Dr. Deriver that he had been trained in bleeding corpses by cutting the leg and inserting a tube. Note, this is where the Dylan did it theorists get much of their inclinations that Dylan was Beth's murderer, but three weeks of working in a mortuary would not have given him the skills to bisect Beth in the way she was done. Dylan would have had to have some other training and experience. Unless, of course, he had an accomplice or worked as an accomplice with someone who had the proper skills. Now, let's jump ahead to the October 1948 issue of True Detective magazine featuring an article by George Clark titled The Black Dahlia Murders. The article features Dr. Deriver's profile of the murderer in an attempt by Deriver to bait the murderer into confessing. Clark ends the article with Dr. Deriver believes that the type of person capable of conceiving the kind of death that was inflicted upon Elizabeth Short will sooner or later, by his very nature, be impelled to boast of the crime that shocked the nation. Eventually, then, the homicide detectives may question another in the ever-lengthening list of suspects and discover him to be what he is, the Black Dahlia killer. And so, either swallowing the river's bait, or out of Dylan's sense of civic duty, or for other reasons only known by himself, Dylan sends the river a letter. A letter that will change the lives of both men, leading to the humiliating holding and questioning of Dylan and the downfall of Deriver and his sex offense bureau. The letter Deriver received detailed that the sender knew a person he believed to be the murderer, calling him, the infamous one. A character he had met in San Francisco the previous March and had been associated with him for about two months. He claimed that, infamous one, had a motive for killing Beth and at least knew those involved in the murder and may have been present. The sender also claimed to be an aspiring writer who had an interest in Deriver's work and offered him his full assistance in the case. The letter was postmarked Miami Beach, and the return address was a Miami post office box. It was signed Jack Sand. Now, we'll never know Dylan's motives for writing the letter. Did he really want to help with the investigation? Was he really a writer hoping this would lead to an article or book deal? Did he have something else up his sleeve? Was he the murderer who had, as the article stated, finally been impelled to boast of the crime that shocked the nation? Was he just another confessing Sam or something akin to a confessing Sam who just wanted to stroke his ego by seeking attention? Was he a conman working alone or with an accomplice scheming to achieve some nefarious goal that only he or they knew? We will never know the truth of it, but on that day in October 1948, Deriver believed the killer had just contacted him. Not wanting to reel the possible killer in too fast and risk losing him, Deriver waited a few weeks to reply. Using the sender's claim to be an aspiring writer, 
Deriver says he is working on his own book and is interested in hearing more about this so-called infamous one. But of course the doctor already believes the sender to be the infamous one. And so, an almost pen pal-like relationship developed between the doctor and his bait. Dylan responded, still using the alias Jack Sand, telling Deriver that his suspect was named Jeff, and although the two only knew each other for about six weeks they had shared a number of intimacies and confided in each other their mutual aspirations to break into writing. Once Dylan claimed that he and Jeff had picked up two women in a bar, and Dylan claimed to have watched Jeff bed both women. Dylan also claimed that Jeff admitted knowing Beth Short and patronized many of the same places she had. He also stated that he had fled Los Angeles because many of his associates had been questioned about the murder. As the back-and-forth communications continued, Dylan opened up more and more to the doctor. He admitted that Jeff started hanging around him because of all the pretty girls that associated with Dylan. Presumably the pretty girls had been prostitutes that Dylan had been pimping. Dylan even began giving theories as to why Beth had been murdered. Suggesting that the killer may have been mocked and threatened exposure by her to his friends, because of an affair not considered proper by the average person. Dylan speculated that the murder had been committed out of revenge for this mockery and his desire to inflict pain of some nature on her and experience a new sensation by accident. Thus leading to the complete annihilation of her and other victims. Dr. Deriver theorized that Jeff was just a delusion in Jack Sands' mind and also believed that Jack Sands was just an alias. He also noted that the letters were full of spelling errors that no serious aspiring writer would have left uncorrected and compared them to errors in the Avenger communications. But one of the things that struck Dr. Deriver the most was that Dylan always referred to the victim as Elizabeth, never using her last name, calling her the Black Dahlia, or using a generic, impersonal case name. He thought this brought a strange level of intimacy that showed that he knew Beth on a personal level. Believing he had found the best suspect yet, Deriver went to friend and police chief Clemens Horall to expand the investigation. Horall assigned members of the gangster squad to assist Deriver, first sending an Officer Jones to Miami to gather information. Officer Jones' first name is unknown, and Dr. Deriver's daughter, Jock Daniel, even raises suspicions as to whether he even existed in her book, Curse of the Black Dahlia, saying, When I asked Dad, my retired homicide detective friend, if he knew any Officer Jones, he said that there was no Officer Jones on the department at that time except his partner, Stuart Jones, and he knew for sure that that Jones never went to Miami to spy on Leslie Dillon. So what am I to believe? A few pages later, she details the questioning of a private investigator, Fred Whitman, by Deputy District Attorney Arthur L. Veach and H. L. Stanley of the Bureau of Investigation. Whitman's answers confirm that Police Chief Horall and Assistant Chief Reed did decide to send a man to watch Dylan. When asked where Dylan was at that time, Whitman responded, In Miami, Florida. It was felt that if any man from the homicide department or squad were suddenly to disappear for some period of time, the newspapers would reach the conclusion that he was on the Elizabeth Short case. And along the line somewhere, a captain of one squad, homicide or gangster, I believe, came into the conference, and it was ultimately decided to have a chap by the name of Jones, whose first name I do not know, in the gangster detail to go to Florida to check on Leslie Dillon. He was sent without any knowledge of what he was assigned to other than the observation, and my understanding is that he even left his police credentials at home. I believe that he was picked up by the police in Miami or Miami Beach, Florida. There are the two towns, and I have never been there. So I don't have them straight, but this chap moves from one to the other, but at any rate I believe that Jones was picked up talked his way out of it with the Miami Police Department and again picked up by the FBI to whom he explained his reasons for being there. I have never seen the reports. It is my understanding that Jones reported that he had watched Leslie Dillon for a considerable period of time and he found that Dillon spent several hours a day staked out, standing across the street from a restaurant where his wife worked, watched the thing very closely. 
And let me say parenthetically, I am advised that for two or three years Elizabeth Short went to Florida and did in fact work as a waitress in that particular restaurant. The significance of that is that Dylan has denied that he ever knew Elizabeth Short. Dylan, as I recall, was reported to have had peroxide hair and run around with his shirt out and somewhat chummy with the taxicab driver by the name of Larry Fanucci, will say F-A-N-U-C-C-I. I don't know how to spell it. Dylan became apprehensive that he was being watched. The sequence I don't know, but he went to the FBI and said that he understood that he might possibly be wanted for murder, some offense, in Los Angeles. Did they want him? They told him no and let him go. In the meantime, the Los Angeles Police Department, I believe, communicated with the postmaster in Miami Beach or Miami, Florida, whichever it is, apropos of this box, and Dylan was called in there. He makes reference to it in his letters. The postmaster let him go. He locked himself up in his room for several days, I think probably for two days. Veach then asks if his report is based on the Jones reports. Whitman answers. As I understand them, which I have not seen. Pure hearsay, but nonetheless I believe that is true. Larry Fanucci brought in his food. He didn't leave. Finally he left and went over to the opposite Miami, whichever it was. Jones then had the opportunity to get into the room. He found, I understood, the room to be in a considerable state of disorder, some garments, shirts possibly, of something was torn with violence. They searched the room rather thoroughly, or let's say thoroughly found that the fellow was an omnivorous reader, not particularly detective stories, but almost anything. He found, I believe under a lamp, possibly a floor lamp, that that two newspaper clippings, one of them was, shows a picture laying dead who was killed by a guard and the guard is being congratulated by the warden of the Cook County Jail for having killed him. The other newspaper clippings show the headline shoots out girl's tooth. I understand that Officer Jones further ransacks the premises, or the apartment, which I believe it was occupied by Dylan, and up probably hidden on the tracks, or above the tracks of a drawer, in some kind of drawer or table, was the only detective magazine in the place. I have photographed a copy, the copy, or the front page of that issue. It is true Detective October 1948, though possibly 1947. The magazine of course is available, and that is the cover of it bearing the legend The Black Dahlia Murders, plural. Adding to the finding of the true detective were notes written in ballpoint pen. Dylan would have to have obtained an expensive ballpoint pen somewhere. I doubt he would have had the money to buy one, but he could have stolen one during his short time in the Navy or stolen one from one of his bellhop jobs. One thing to wonder about Jones is why wasn't he ever questioned? As Whitman stated, the parts of his testimony about Jones were pure hearsay. And that he never actually saw the Jones report. Jones was there off the record, out of his jurisdiction without notifying the local authorities, and without any proper police identification, although that is typical of how the gangster squad operated, even in Los Angeles. It is no wonder that his questioning raised some concerns and brought in the scrutiny of local police and FBI agents. Was Jones even his real name? If Jones, or whoever he was, had been questioned, has his testimony conveniently disappeared along with so much other evidence from the Black Dahlia files? All of this led to Horal giving Deriver the go-ahead to lure in Dylan, giving him the funds to send a plane ticket to the now-growing uncooperative Dylan. Of course, Dylan believed he was a suspect, he had even went to the FBI. But he still agreed to meet Deriver. Why? I think the conman in Dylan was seeing what he could get out of it. At the least, I think he was visualizing his name on the cover of True Detective as the author of another article. At the most, I think he was trying to pull off something bigger. It would later be discovered that Dylan brought to his meeting with Deriver a pair of shoes similar to Beth's shoe recovered from the dump, a dog collar showing evidence of being cleaned, seven safety razor blades, and 700 phenobarbital pills. But we'll get to the weirdness of the Deriver Dylan road trip that concluded with Dylan being handcuffed naked to a hotel room radiator and charged with the murder of Beth Short. But before we get to the road trip, I'd like to touch on the controversial aspects of this investigation. It has been said that Deriver and the gangster squad went rogue. 
Larry Harnish states on his LA Daily Mirror blog. The so-called gangster squad conducted a rogue, off-the-books and unsanctioned investigation of the Black Dahlia case that infringed on the LAPD Homicide Division's inquiry into the killing of Elizabeth Short. The gangster squad's rogue operation was led by Dr. Joseph Paul DeRiver under the theory that Leslie Dillon had a split personality and, under this split personality, killed Elizabeth Short. The gangster squad's unauthorized interference in the case and the resulting Leslie Dillon fiasco triggered a grand jury investigation. While it is odd that lead investigators Harry Hansen and Finus Brown, as well as other investigators officially involved in the homicide investigation were left out of the loop. The Deriver investigation was not rogue or unsanctioned. Police Chief Horal and his assistant Chief Reed sanctioned the doctor's investigation and assigned members of the Gangster Squad to assist, with the complete cooperation of Gangster Squad leader Willie Burns, mostly to drive, provide backup, and protection for Deriver should Dylan flip out and attack him. But another major part of their plan was to record any phone conversations between Dylan and Deriver, and later bug Dylan's motel room and tap his phone. And the gangster squad's con keeler was a master at bugging and wiretapping. And although it seems odd that the gangster squad would be assigned to a murder case, it really would have been part of their duties. In Paul Lieberman's book, The Gangster Squad, he states about the squad's duties. They would also be available for other chores, as Chief C. B. Horrell saw fit. This must have been one of the squad's other chores. But why were homicide detectives left out? They were not left out completely. Homicide Chief Francis Kearney, Donahoe's replacement after he was sent back to robbery, was present at the meeting finalizing the details of Deriver's plan. So this plan was sanctioned and given the go-ahead by those on top. For reasons known to only those present, the lead investigators in the Black Dahlia case were not informed of the operation. The simple and widely believed reason is that the press were watching Hansen and Brown closely for any new leads, and so large an operation outside of L.A. would have alerted reporters that something was up. Pew Eatwell also speculates on page 97 of Black Dahlia, Red Rose that gangster squad involvement may have meant mafia involvement and, or police corruption in Beth's murder was suspected, and that maybe Hansen and Brown were not trusted, mostly due to speculation that Finus Brown was tied in with Mark Hansen, working as a bagman. But as we looked at in the Hansen episode, it is just as likely that the connection between Hansen and Finus Brown was that Brown was involved in an ongoing undercover operation at the Florentine Gardens and that Hansen may have been an informant. But Mark Hansen will return to the story later, seeing that some theorists suspect Dylan as working for him. And thus the Dahlia story gets even more convoluted, with competing theories slugging out the pros and cons like prize fighters beating the hell out of one another in the ring. And the quagmire gets thicker, and the rabbit hole gets deeper. And we haven't even come to the Hodel theory yet. And so Deriver called Dylan, and they arranged to meet in Las Vegas. Deriver and gangster squad officer J.J. O'Mara, who had been chosen to be both the driver and Deriver's protection, met Dylan in Las Vegas with Willie Burns and Captain Francis Carney, following close behind. They left almost immediately heading to a resort in Banning, California, west of Palm Springs. O'Mara recalled Dylan telling Deriver about his three weeks at the Han funeral home and how to bleed a corpse. O'Mara noted that Dylan spoke in a very soft, well-modulated voice, and also recalled that Dylan constantly talked about women. At the resort, O'Mara listened through the wall as Deriver got Dylan to open up about Jeff. He admitted the man's name was Jeff Connors, but that turned out to be an alias, his real name, Arthur or Artie Lane, but in Deriver's mind, Connors was a schizophrenic delusion concocted in Dylan's psychotic mind. But even though the doctor's basic assumption about Dylan was wrong, Dylan gave Deriver and the listening O'Mara enough bizarre information that members of the gangster squad believed that Dylan was the murderer for as long as they lived. When Deriver asked if Dylan had an idea as to why Beth's body had been bisected, he suggested that Jeff would have liked to see how far his penis entered her. Dylan also admitted that he liked to take Benzedrine, 
and would also take phenobarbital and add it to food to knock women out. Dylan told Deriver that he thought a picture of the Virgin Mary reminded him of the Black Dahlia, going on to state he liked the hairstyle of the figure in the picture and then strangely commented that he liked girls with big mouths, a possible reference to Beth's facial cuts. At this point, Omera, who had been peeking through a crack in the door, noticed Dylan's face contort into what he described as an expression of rage and hate. Omera would later describe the incident to the grand jury. This man was inhuman. To my observation he's an individual that I have never seen the likes of before, and probably will never see again, if I may say so. He was, his facial expression would change and his temperaments would change very quickly and suddenly. There was something about the man. What you might call raises a man's animal instincts that there is something there, in other words makes the hair on the back of your neck bristle up. As bizarre as Dylan's statements were, things were only going to get weirder when Deriver decided to do an impromptu full-body examination of Dylan. First, he asked Dylan to take off his shirt. Both Deriver and the watching Omera noted that the tall, thin weakling they presumed Dylan to be was actually strong and powerfully built. Deriver commented. You are not the type I thought you were at all, or maybe you are. We are just among men here. Have you any objection to dropping your trousers? Dylan obliged, and proved that he was the type that Deriver thought he was, a man with a small penis. Deriver had already speculated that the mockery Dylan had mentioned in one of his letters had alluded to the Black Dahlia mocking his penis size and threatening to expose his shortcomings to his friends. Dr. Deriver said Dylan had a juvenile penis, typical of an eight-year-old boy. He also speculated that the reason for the incision above Beth's suprapubic region was, just as Dylan had said, to see how far his penis penetrated her. Deriver also remembered the strange article found in Dylan's Florida apartment about the girl getting her tooth shot out. An 18-year-old John B. Elias had shot 15-year-old Amalia Chipley's tooth out with a BB gun because she and her friends had been insulting him. But what truly sealed the deal in Dr. Deriver's mind was that he claimed Dylan had told him about information not released by the police, the control questions. Many have speculated what the control questions were and concluded that they were what happened to the plucked out pubic hair and removed Rose tattoo. Some researchers believe that Dylan rightly stated that the pubic hair had been shoved into her rectum and the tattoo shoved into her vagina. However official recorded testimony scrutinized by grand jury investigator Jemison contradicts this after listening to these recordings. What do you think the killer did with the hair he shaved off the private parts of the body of Elizabeth Short? I think the killer would probably have thrown that into a toilet and flushed it. What do you think a killer such as he was would do with the piece of flesh with the tattoo on it after he cut it off her thigh? Well, I think he would probably have thrown that down the toilet and flushed it. Supporters of the Dylan did it theory claim that these recordings were made after Dylan's arrest and that he had changed his story. On the road again, the group headed to Los Angeles so that Dylan could attempt to find Connors, but Deriver also hoped to trip him up by driving him around the Limert Park area. But after the group left the resort, members of the gangster squad searched Dylan's room. It was here they found the previously mentioned shoes, size nine and a half, black suede, loafer style, with platform heels. After questioning, the hotel manager said that another party had not left the shoes. More of the previously mentioned items brought along by Dylan would be discovered after his detainment while searching his luggage. Stopping in El Monte, California, the group checked into the La Bonita Motel on Garvey Avenue, where Captain Kearney and Willie Burns, with the help of the gangster squad's master bug man, Con Keeler, had already bugged the rooms and tapped the phones. The first place they checked was the A1 trailer park in Long Beach, where Dylan claimed to have lived in 1946. The car had just barely stopped before Dylan raced from the vehicle and entered the park office. When O'Mara and Deriver finally caught up, they saw Dylan engaged in a frantic conversation with the desk clerk as the clerk quickly erased something from the ledger. O'Mara recalled the incident. 
I noticed him pointing down to the ledger. It turned out to be a book. A record of people in attendance at this trailer court. It was a hurried up deal. He more or less rushed in there. Wanted to get something changed. Before we made our way in there. When Deriver questioned the desk clerk, a one jigs more, he admitted that he had changed the dates Dylan had stayed there and the time of his departure. They next headed toward Dr. Deriver's office, but decided to take the scenic route through Limert Park. Dylan showed an exceptional knowledge of the area, even correcting Omera and he pulled into an alley, mentioning that it was a dead end. He also knew that the route was out of the way from the doctor's office. Of course, this had been Deriver's plan from the start, to see Dylan's reaction in the area of the body dump site. When Deriver asked him if he recalled that the Black Dahlia's body had been found in the area, Dylan strangely said. What body do you mean? You mean the woman who was stomped and kicked? Seeming to reference the Jean French murder, often added to the list of werewolf murder suspects along with Beth. We will look into these murders in a future episode. Deriver suggested that Dylan knew the exact woman he was referring to. Dylan did not deny it, but Omera noticed that Dylan suddenly acted woozy and started weaving around. The next stop was San Francisco. Deriver and Omera followed the now exuberant Dylan as he led them around town to the different hotels he was familiar with. They never found Connors, but this incident lends proof that Dylan was well acquainted with the hotels and employees, and the hotel employees knew him as well. After a disappointing San Francisco excursion, Deriver and Omera had had enough, so had the other police members of the operation. After not finding Connors, and not even getting a clue to his whereabouts or confirmation that he even existed, Deriver had grown even more entrenched in his belief that Jeff Connors was nothing but a delusion conjured in Dylan's mind. So, he tried pressing Dylan further. Once, at dinner, Deriver deliberately ordered steaks extremely rare. When Dylan found his too bloody to eat, Deriver thought this was because of a guilty conscience due to the blood and gore of the murder. They made their way back to Los Angeles and checked into the Strand Hotel under the name O'Shea. And it was here that the police ran out of patience or money. They had sent an undercover officer off the books to spy on Dylan, flown him to Las Vegas, driven him from Vegas, to Palm Springs, to El Monte, to San Francisco, and now back to the heart of Los Angeles. Deriver had made up his mind that Dylan was guilty. Police officers that had grown to know Dylan believed he was guilty. The only problem was getting him to confess. It was time for old school tactics. Dylan was stripped naked, photographed, and handcuffed to a radiator. Here is his story in his own words. They kept me in the motel room until three or four other men arrived, and then they began to question me. In the middle of it, Deriver insisted I was too knowledgeable and too intelligent to conceal the truth from myself. I said I didn't know what I'd be concealing from myself, and he said facts too painful to remember. Then he began to ask me intimate details about the mutilations and the things that had been done to the Dahlia. But the only things I knew about them was what I'd read in the papers and from the detective magazine and what Deriver had told me. But Deriver would ask me a question and then put the answer right in my mouth. I couldn't talk to anyone. I couldn't make a call to my wife or try to find a lawyer or anyone to help me. They just kept questioning me. They wouldn't stop. They made me take off all my clothes and took photographs of me stripped naked. While they had me handcuffed to a radiator, they kept on with the questioning. They really got nasty. He wanted me to confess that I'd killed the Dahlia, and I couldn't confess to it. But they had me just about convinced I was crazy or something, and that maybe I did kill the Dahlia, and then just forgot about it. Somehow, Dylan managed to get his hands on a postcard, and even after a week of grueling, dehumanizing interrogation, he still had the foresight to address the postcard to one of the preeminent lawyers in Los Angeles, Jerry Geisler. Dylan wrote. On the front. If found, please mail. On the back. I am being held in room 219 and 21, Strand Hotel, 
Phone FE 3101 in connection with the Black Dahlia murder by Dr. J.P. Deriver as far as I can tell. I would like legal counsel. Mr. Leslie Dillon. He also writes his wife's name and address in Florida and his aunt's telephone number in Los Angeles. Then Dillon managed to toss the postcard out the window where the odds of it being picked up would have been slim. But by chance, literally William Chance, one of Aggie Underwood's reporters, with the Herald Express, found it in the gutter. It seems strange, if not incredibly convenient, that one of Aggie's reporters, Aggie Underwood, friend of Dr. Deriver, found something akin to a needle in a haystack. At any rate, whether a one in a billion chance or a pre planned event between two ambitious friends, one wanting to score the big arrest, and the other wanting to score the big scoop, Leslie Dillon was brought to the Highland Park Police Station and booked for the murder of Elizabeth Short. A press conference followed. Police Chief Horall stated, There's no doubt in my mind that Dillon is the hottest suspect there has ever been in this case. Deriver, said Dillon. Knew more about the Dahlia murder and the police did, and more about abnormal sex psychopathia than most psychiatrists. A spokesman for the district attorney's office gave the following statement. We're not going to let anybody talk to him, except ourselves, until we've got a closed case. Now, the official interrogation began. Conveniently with a photographer and all concerned parties present. At least most of the concerned parties, Harry Hansen and Finus Brown, had just been called and were on the way. And so Dylan went on to describe his further grilling. It went on for about 10 hours, I was losing track of what was happening. I kept insisting I hadn't killed her, but the doctor tried again and again to convince me that I was blocking out the truth, and that it was necessary for me to confess the truth and be free of the troubles I was feeling. It was like a nightmare. For a time, all went well with the case. Police searched his luggage, finding the previously mentioned hundreds of phenobarbital pills, razor blades, and dog leash that showed signs of a strenuous cleaning. The dog leash was sent to the lab, but results of the test were never revealed. I wonder if Dylan engaged in autoerotic asphyxiation. That would be one explanation for the dog leash. A shoe fetish would also explain the women's shoes found earlier. Or the shoes, dog leash, and other items could have been to play a game with Deriver. O'Mara mentioned Dylan was Super cunning. He would shoot a few statements and watch your reactions. He was very, very clever, in my opinion. You had to more or less spar with him, box with him. It did seem that Dylan had a way of pushing driver's buttons, even getting the usually shrewd, in control, doctor to lose his cool. From recordings of driver's questioning of Dylan. You are the one who murdered Elizabeth Short. Dr. Deriver, the trouble with this is that you first reach your own conclusions about this case, and then you try to dig up things to prove that your conclusions are correct. What do you think I am, a child? What do you mean by talking to me that way? I'm a person who has been around. Or maybe it takes one con man to know another. Deriver used his own aliases, had been living and working under one for decades. His real name was Israel, and it would turn out his medical qualifications were dubious, but I'll save more about that later and Deriver's own bonus episode to come. Suffice it to say, Deriver was a man of secrets and aliases, just like Leslie Dillon and Jeff Connors, or whoever they really were. There were multiple games being played, and it would come out that Dillon and Connors had exchanged aliases and even used each other's real names. But now back to the investigation. The press did their normal digging, uncovering Dillon's questionable past and printing the sordid details. Then, investigators discovered that Dillon's wife's aunt, Nellie Mae Hinshaw, lived on South Crenshaw Boulevard, only about four miles from the body dump site, and that Dillon had stayed there. Jimmy Richardson's examiner reporters claimed that the police could prove Dylan had stayed with Hinshaw at the time of the murder, but Hinshaw could not recall the dates. Then they found that Dylan and his wife had both stayed with his wife's mother, 
Mrs. Laura Stevenson for two months around Christmas 1946, and that her South Normandy Avenue address was only a couple blocks away from the cafe where Beth's shoes and handbag had been found before being collected with the garbage and later rediscovered at the city dump. Dylan knew the area well and had a history there, explaining how he had known his way around when Deriver and O'Mara had taken him through the area, but also proving Deriver's initial suspicion before this knowledge came out that Dylan was acquainted with the neighborhood. Then investigators searching San Francisco for clues showed a photo of Dylan to a hotel manager who identified Dylan as Jeff Connors. This was seemingly the proof Deriver had needed all along. Deriver, the police, and the press all believed they had found their man. But then the real Jeff Connors showed up. He had been in the small town of Gilroy, shacked up with his current girlfriend. Police had no choice but to let Dylan go. All along, their belief that Jeff Connors was a delusion of Dylan's twisted mind had been the mortar holding their case together. When he turned up as a real human being, their case collapsed like a ton of bricks. But in time it would turn out that Jeff Connors wasn't really Jeff Connors, and at least once in a while, Leslie Dillon was indeed Jeff Connors. As previously mentioned, the two were sharing names, both real and aliases. It turned out that Jeff Connors was just an alias. His real name was Arthur Lane, but he also went by Art Lau, or Artie Lane. And it has already been established that Dylan used Jeff Connors as his own alias when the San Francisco hotel manager identified him under that name. Why would the two share an alias? I can think of no good reason. Especially when it has already been established that Dylan had a criminal history. And when you figure in that witnesses had mistaken one for the other does cast doubt as to the so-called proven alibi that Dylan had been in San Francisco at the time of the murder confirmed by witnesses after Finus Brown went to San Francisco to check on Dylan's story in timeline. And the two did look enough alike that the casual observer could mistake one for the other, especially if there was confusion over the names. But now it was time for Connors to sit on the hot seat, Dylan to walk away a free man, and Deriver and the police to face the press in an almost parody of the previous press conference. Chief of Detectives W. J. Bradley approached the anxious press and gave this statement. We have insufficient evidence to warrant holding Dylan. Until this morning, we thought his story was phony and that the Jeff Connors he told us about was a figment of his imagination. But then Jeff Connors was arrested in Gilroy, and now what can we do but believe Dylan? And, I guess, that now we'll have to sugar Dylan up a bit. But Dylan was thinking a bit of sugar wouldn't do it. He had eyes on the whole cake. Even at that press conference he was planning his coming lawsuit. I have been in custody for a week. I was handcuffed as early as January 3rd, a week before my arrest was announced. I have been guarded in hotel rooms by detectives ever since. I'm going to have to talk to my attorney before I decide whether or not I'm going to sue anybody for what's been done to me. After the press conference, and adding insult to injury, Harry Hansen and Finus Brown, who hadn't even had a hand in the Dylan fiasco, loaded Dylan's luggage into the trunk of a waiting car. But it wasn't just anyone's car. It was Dr. Deriver's. The man who believed he had solved the most famous murder case in decades now had to chaffer his one and only suspect to Dylan's aunt's house on Crenshaw Boulevard. Connors lived in world of delusion that may have rivaled Dylan's. He, too, was an aspiring writer. And like Beth, he claimed to be an actor or said he wanted to be an actor, but it was all just talk. He claimed to have been a bit player and stand-in while he worked at Columbia Studios, however it turned out he was just a common laborer. He did admit to knowing Dylan, but downplayed their association and said they never discussed the Black Dahlia murder. He also claimed to have known Beth on sight and said he and his wife had gone to a bar with her the night before her body was found. He then said he had reported the incident to the police. But later left L.A. when some of his friends started being questioned for the murder. He also identified his ex-wife as Vicki Evans, who had recently been arrested with Robert Mitchum on marijuana charges, although he did give her real name of Grace Allen. 
Things were straightened out after Evans stated in a newspaper article that she never heard of the jerk, and then the real Grace Allen was found. She said she had not seen Connors for a year and a half since they were divorced in Tijuana. Grace never mentioned anything about a bar or drinks with the Dahlia, but did provide Connors an alibi, saying he left for work at Columbia Studios at 2 p.m., returned at 11 p.m., and spent the night with her. Columbia Pictures confirmed that Connors had been employed there. His wife also said, Jeff was a screwball. Always imagining things. He never acted in pictures as far as I know, but he told people he did. He was on a studio labor gang, I think. So far as I know, he never knew the Black Dahlia. I think when he said he saw her in a bar, he was just dreaming up the whole thing. Personally, I think the two were con men and thieves, working together to steal from hotel guests and using each other's names and aliases to cast doubt as to their whereabouts. Dylan had shown during the trip with O'Mara and Deriver to San Francisco that he was known to the hotel workers. And later, a hotel manager identified a photo of Dylan as Jeff Connors. This is strangely similar to how Connors mistakenly identified a photo of Vicki Evans as his ex-wife, Grace, proving how two different people could be mistaken for one another, even when the one doing the identifying has been in intimate contact with the person. Imagine how easy it would be for strangers or casual acquaintances to be mistaken by deliberate imposters. Thievery would explain how a bottom feeder like Dylan would have had a ballpoint pen. He had also been dishonorably discharged from the Navy for stealing wristwatches. And incidentally, a military-style wristwatch had been found in the lot where Beth's body was found. Just how well Dylan and Connors knew each other or what their game was will never be known. They were both a couple of liars. But the two were much closer than what Connors claimed. After all, Dylan watched Connors have sex with two women. We can only wonder if Dylan was sitting across the room, wearing his black, high-heeled pumps, and tightening his dog leash around his neck as he auto-erotically pleasured himself. In part two, we will continue the investigation into Leslie Dillon, expanding it to the events at the Astor Motel and speculation as to whether Mark Hansen was the man from Batavia.